Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Battles of the American Civil War with your host, Bang and Dang. And we have more of that old Red River campaign that we've been uh, spending about now four episodes on or something like that. Which, this will be it until a couple of weeks after last week's Blair's Landing and Monnet's Ferry. But this is the last one in the Arkansas portion of the Red River campaign. And uh, Union just can't seem to catch a break in this campaign, the Camden expedition or the Red River campaign. And then I think the Battle of Albemarle Sound. We got a uh, exclusive riverboats or uh, what are they called? Navies. Got some Navy battles happening in the Albemarle Sound. Albemarle. <laughs> You know, before that, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network shorts, clips, full podcast episodes, as well as our YouTube exclusive Dart League at Bang Dang Network and Spotify, Apple. Give us a review. Starting off with the Battle of Jenkins Ferry, and then we got the Albemarle Sound in this one. And next week, we'll be on to the big Battle of 1864, which is the Wilderness Battle, Battle of the Wilderness. Jenkins Ferry, fall April 30th, 1864, at Jenkins Ferry, which is southwest of Little Rock in present day Grant County, Arkansas. With Union Major General Frederick Steele's forces facing off against the Confederate General E. Kirby Smith's forces. Yeah, like I said, this will be the last of the Red River campaign in Arkansas. We got two more battles in this whole campaign, but they'll be coming here in a couple more months. Steele's Federal forces reach Jenkins Ferry, Arkansas on the Saline River at 2 p.m. on April 29th in their retreat from Camden to their base at Little Rock, Arkansas. They found that the river was swollen by heavy rain. The rain continued in torrents torrents on April 29th, and the riverbank and approaches became a quagmire, giggity-giggity, hmm. of mud and standing water. The tired and famished federal troops could not construct their pontoon bridge and get their wagons and artillery out of the mud and over the river. Out of the, the mud and over the river during the night they tried. Although the federal cavalry did get across. All right. Well, yeah, they had just, uh, right. the little horses. Since federal commanders realized that Kirby Smith's Confederate forces were rushing to catch up to them, the United States Army Rear Guard built breastworks and took a formidable defensible <laughs> formidable defensible a formidable defensive position to oppose the old Rebs when they arrived in force on the morning of thirtieth of April, eighteen sixty four. Mm-hmm. With Steele continuing to supervise the river crossing, Brigadier General Frederick Solomon or Friedrich, Frederick, Friedrich, Friedrich, Friedrich should have commanded the rear guard action against the pursuing Confederates, but he left the, fl- uh, the task to Brigadier General Samuel Rice and his 4,000 Federal infantrymen. Before dawn, April 30th, Marmaduke's Confederate cavalry troopers arrived near Jenkins Ferry, dismounted and skirmished with Steele's rear guard infantry force about two miles from the Saline River crossing. Rice had placed the Federal forces behind breastworks, abatis, and rifle pits. Oh, fantastic. Rice's lines that were protected by Cox Creek. Cox Creek. Sometimes shown as Toxie Creek. And uh, that was on the right. <laughs> no. All right. Uh, while some accounts have stated that an impassable cane swamp bordered the federal position on one side and thick, rain-drenched timber on the other. Other sources state that the left flank was vulnerable, and only after failed rebel efforts to turn his left flank did Rice extend the left end of his line until it rested on a steep wooded slope. I think he would have done that in the first place, but... Mm, right. The difficult approach to the old uh, federale position was only about 400 yards wide and would allow at most only 4,000 Confederate infantry to attack at one time. Oh, only. You, need. you know, only. <laughs> in the event, the old Rebs attacked in an even more peaceful, piecemeal manner. Piecemeal, which means unorganized. Right. Uh, Price first committed the infantry under Brigadier General Thomas Churchill and then the infantry under Brigadier General Mosby Parsons to the battle as soon as they arrived on the field. In turn, they each made a little headway made little headway because they had no cover for an attack, and the approach to the Federal position was ankled to knee deep in mud and pools of water. Ooh. Gross. These Confederate divisions the feet are already messed right, up. Right. They're already like <sighs> I hate to see those feet. Uh, these Confederate divisions were sent into no, a, no money for that. I mean they might they money. You got some sickos out there. <laughs> the, these Confederate divisions were sent into the attack piecemeal, brigade by brigade, not in a more concentrated effort. Stupid. Right. Oh, gun just like, go ahead. Oh, gunpowder smoke added to a blanket of fog soon after the battle began. This smoke and fog made it nearly impossible for the opposing forces to see each other, other except by crouching down low and shooting off everybody's anchors. 
this served to help the defenders more I was since they so were mainly lying behind their works and not attempting to get to them through the mud as the old rebel attackers were right. attempting to do. I, mean, I guess, right? They also could simplify fire into a narrow area where the Confederates had to attack and achieve effective probably results. Probably just aim and probably hitting somebody. Right. There's only one way in, guys. The old mud and standing water prevented cavalry and artillery from participating much in the battle. I get it. In fact, the Confederates lost three artillery pieces to a charge by the 2nd Kansas Colored Infantry and the 29th Iowa Infantry Regiments from their fortified positions. After Price's forces under Brigadier Generals Churchill and Parsons had made little progress, Kirby Smith came up with the large Texas Infantry Division under Major General John Walker. Walker carried on the attack in the same manner as the previous divisions had done brigade by brigade. All three Confederate Brigade commanders under Walker were wounded in these attacks. Oh. Come on, guy. Oh. All right. Well, two of them, Brigadier General William Scurry and Colonel Horace Randall, were mortally wounded. Mortally. By... Know, United States Brigadier General Sam Rice also was mortally wounded oh, poor guy. in the final rebel assault at Jenkins Ferry. After taking about 1,000 casualties in the repeated attacks against the well-fortified federal troops, while inflicting only about 700 casualties on the defenders, including the capture of stragglers, the old Rebs gave up piecemeal attacks on the old federal positions. Before leaving the field, though, some African-American soldiers of the 2nd Kansas shot Confederate wounded near Rice's line in retaliation for the shooting of African-American soldiers who were trying to surrender at Poison Spring and the killing of wounded African-American soldiers at Mark's Mill. Oh, they heard about that shit, and they were pissed. They're like, all right. Well, of course they heard about it. You think they got reprimanded by their officers? Of course they heard about it. It's the same campaign. Do you think they got reprimanded? I I highly doubt it. I bet they did. I bet you they didn't. Just because they're soldiers don't mean they treated fairly. I guarantee they probably didn't. Maybe. <laughs> Doubt it, though. <laughs> By about 3 p.m., April 30th, the Federal forces finally crossed the Salient River with all their remaining men and the artillery pieces and equipment and supply wagons, which were not irretrievably stuck in the mud, oh. which they burned. Oh. Steele's forces were compelled to abandon many more wagons in the swamp north of the Saline. Don't we have navigators to send out right. scouts or something? Uh, the Confederates did not renew the attack as Steele's men crossed the pontoon bridge on the afternoon of April 30th. All not right. only were the Confederates exhausted... But the Federal forces had set up artillery and infantry on the opposite side of the river to protect the remaining Federal soldiers as they crossed. Well, I would assume they would. Well, after they crossed that river, Steele's forces cut and burned the pontoon bridge, which they would not need for the remainder of their march, obviously. With no way to get across the river, the old rebels could not follow them. Well, you know, besides building their own pontoon. but Right. By not trapping Steele's force at Camden or cutting them off before they reached the Saline River, the rebels under Kirby Smith lost a good chance to destroy Steele's army. Sure did. Which was the major portion of the Federale force in Can- Arkansas. After crossing the river and three days further march, Steele's forces regrouped within the fortifications of Little Rock. Steele's forces down in Little Rock. The old rebels couldn't chase them. Because, you see, they burned down the pontoon bridge at Saline. Without that, they could prevent the Union from reaching Little Rock. (laughs) Considering the numbers engaged and percentage of the casualties, the Jenkins Ferry Battle was one of the Civil War's bloodiest. Oh. Both armies paid dearly for the engagement. I bet they did. The Confederates officially reported 86 men killed, 356 wounded, and one missing for a total of 443. Oh. The numbers would have been much higher, perhaps 8 to 1,000, if Walker's division, uh, Walker's Texas division's losses were known. So that probably is about 1,000. Right. Walker filed no report on that battle. Don't know why. Mm. Officially reported but incomplete federal casualties were 63 killed, 413 wounded, 45 missing, which is a total of 521. Hmm. That's a lot out of only like 4,000 troops. He ain't kidding. Mm. The United States total casualty figure was incomplete because Brigadier General John Thayer failed to report. As noted above, in view of the incomplete or missing casualty reports, historian Shelby Foote and Gregory J.W. Irwin in the Heidler's Encyclopedia of the American Civil War, they used 1,700 as the best estimate of the total rebel and federale casualty figures, respectively. Uh, the Battle of Jenkins Ferry may be counted as a federal victory, at least tactically. I think both. Uh, not only did the old Rebs sustain more casualties, but Steele's federal troops successfully held back the attacking rebels. Yeah, which allowed the federal forces time and space to move most of the remaining wagons and all their stuff across the saline and escape back to Little Rock. Right. 
However, see. Steele's victory was hollow from a strategic viewpoint. Oh. Kirby Smith's forces held the battlefield, prevented Steele from joining with or further assisting Banks, and forced Steele's continued retreat back to Little Rock, obviously. Oh, okay. In the campaign overall, Steele had lost 3,000 men to Smith's loss of 2,000. Wow. Many of Kirby Smith's men were lightly wounded, though. Well, oh. They lived to fight another day. Well, Steele also lost 10 artillery pieces to balance with three captured. They don't balance at all. <laughs> oh. So he lost seven. Right. He also lost 635 wagons, 2,500 mule, enough horses to mount a cavalry brigade, and a long, long list of captured material, including ammo, food, and medical supplies. Yeah, dude. They, he, he, they, can left, they came back with nothing. <laughs> Sad. The Federal Alley Force lost General Rice, while the Confederate Force lost General Scurry and Colonel Randall. Yeah. Kirby Smith's last hope to destroy Steele's army outside of his well-fortified base at Little Rock was dashed as a result of mismanaged, disjointed, and piecemeal attacks at Jenkins Ferry. Yeah, that was pretty shitty. Yeah. However, while the Federal position and weather conditions limited Confederate options, a more concentrated effort appears to have been possible. The Confederates also failed to concentrate on the more vulnerable Federal left flank at the outset, choosing instead to pursue frontal assaults across Kelly's Field, mm. where the southern lines of infantry were devastated by Federal fire. Oh. Assuming Rice had left this weak spot in or just beyond his defenses, the Confederates' early missed opportunity to attack in this area with concentrated force allowed Rice to see the possible vulnerability in his position and to extend and protect the left flank. Yeah, idiots. <clears throat> They've got this little space in the middle to try to attack them, so let's do that while we're getting mowed down. But meanwhile, this guy's got, uh, what, Didn't the uh, Confederates do that same thing and a couple of battles ago? And there was an open field, and they was like, let's just go right in the open field. Mm. Or is that the the rep? I, mean, I, the, the, <laughs> I think Confederates did that again. Yeah, the Confederates did it again. Yeah, idiots. After the Federal left flank was closed off, an opportunity for a successful Confederate attack at the point, and any realistic chance Kirby Smith and Price might have had to trap most of Steele's force was gone. Gone. After the situation had become hopeless at Camden, Steele gave up all thoughts of uniting with Banks on the Red River in a further campaign to take Shreveport. And he also realized that he had to save his own army. Yeah. The Battle of Jenkins Ferry showed that Steele's force indeed was in danger while it was at Camden and southwest of the Saline River. Yeah, Steele's this decision. is running to stay alive. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, gotta, I, we we got to get the Little Rock, guys. He's holding off, though. His decision to retreat to Little Rock, therefore, was a good one. Hey, those colored folks of Kansas. Banks, in turn, had to give up any hope of renewing his campaign against Shreveport. Oh. His major problems in renewing the campaign actually did not include an insufficient number of men. However, because he was reinforced in late April by forces under Major General John McClernand. That's, I think we'll get there. Banks had logistical problems that would not have gunboat transport and support because of Porter's inability to operate in the shallow water right. of the Red River during that spring and summer. In fact... Banks had to protect Porter's fleet at Alexandria, Louisiana. We had that a couple of weeks ago when mm. they had to back out. Mm -hmm. They couldn't turn around. Uh, he had to support them until it could be freed from the Red River on May 13th before he could move in any direction. Jeez. Oh, wow. Despite some Confederate disappointment and not destroying through casualties or capture, most of the United States forces engaged in the Red River campaign. The old Rebs had a considerable tactical victory, though. The Federals lost 8,000 men over and... Uh, including the Camden expedition, and returned to their starting points at the end of it. So they, they didn't do anything. Right. The old rebels lost 6,500 men. The rebels captured 57 artillery pieces, about 1,000 wagons, most of them loaded. Jeez. 3,500 horses and mules. Sophronia Smith Hunt, who disguised herself as a soldier, lost her first soldier husband there. <laughs> her first soldier. Yeah. She was like, oh, I will marry again. <laughs> <laughs> As Shelby Foote noted, the Confederates also gained a strategic victory in the Red River Campaign. They were able to delay the return of Brigadier General Andrew Smith's 10,000-man force to Major General Sherman's army right. for use in the Atlanta Campaign. Also, about 20,000 Confederates from Alabama were able to reinforce General Joe Johnston in his defense against Sherman. Where's he been? Well, defending against Sherman. <laughs> About to, anyways. Uh, otherwise, these forces might have been engaged in Alabama had Banks attacked Mobile, as uh, Lieutenant General Grant would have preferred, but um, he attempted to take Shreveport under Halleck's plan instead. Oh. Ooh, Grant's probably pissed. Oh, I bet. Mm, well, was Grant not the big guy yet? Uh, I don't think so. That yeah, well, a... he became in March, so yeah. it's now, but I think they already planned it and right. geared up for it, right. so... Well, the United States Army tied up significant forces in the Red River Campaign, 
and lost significant numbers of artillery pieces, wagons, mules, yeah. supplies that could have been used in the more decisive campaigns further east. However, Kirby Smith could not get his forces back to Alexandria in time for a further attempt to capture or destroy Banks' force. The disruption and retreat of Federales in our Kansas also cleared the way for Price's 1864 invasion of Missouri. Hmm. Ultimately, that campaign provided no long-term benefit for the old rebels, who were driven out of Missouri again after the Battle of Westport. We'll get to that. And the consequent, and the consequent offensive by uh, U.S. Cavalry under Major General Alfred Pleasanton, which defeated the old rebels in four battles in five days following the Battle of Westport. All right. So they got their ass kicked. All right. The battlefield preserved at Jenkins Ferry's Battleground State Park is one of Camden Expedition sites that together were declared a National Historic Landmark in 1994. Why did it take so long? I don't understand that. The battle is briefly depicted and mentioned by fictional soldiers Private Harold Green of the 116th United States Colored Infantry Regiment and Corporal Ira Clark of the 5th Massachusetts Colored Cavalry Regiment, who speak with President Abraham Lincoln in the opening scene of the 2012 <laughs> Steven Spielberg film, Lincoln. Oh, I tried watching that I movie. couldn't get into that movie. Oh, was so, so I watched long. the first 45 minutes of it. And I couldn't finish it. Yeah, I mean, what do you can do? It's too rough. Now, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter was awesome. <laughs> There's also a <laughs> vampire slayer and another one where he's facing like Good werewolves zombie. and yeah, zombies and crazy. shit. Crazy. Yeah. Well, that was uh, Jenkins Ferry. I guess that was kind of uh, inconclusive, I guess. Well, both sides got what they wanted, I guess. Well, yeah. what are you do? the Union didn't get what they wanted, but right. they stopped the Confederates from getting what they wanted, I guess. Yeah, I mean. What are you going to do? Moving on. Battle of Albemarle. 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 The Battle of Albemarle. Yeah. The Battle of Albemarle Sound. It was an inconclusive naval battle. Hey. Fought in May of 1864 along the coast of North Carolina. Awesome. All right. Three rebel warships, including an ironclad, engaged eight Union gunboats. April 1864. Yeah, warships versus gunboats. How do you think this is going to. Hmm. We'll find out. Uh, April 1864. A rebel army with the aid of the CSS Albemarle. Forced to surrender the Union garrison at Plymouth. Robert Hoke, commander of a rebel army in North Carolina, encouraged by his success at Plymouth, attempted to retake New Bern. Oh, New Bern. I haven't seen those guys since like 1862. Well, it's been control of the Union since 1862. All right. First proposed attack on New Bern, Hoke again turned to the aid of Albemarle. Which had been a decisive factor in the Battle of Plymouth. Uh, the Battle of Plymouth we didn't do because it was literally like nothing. Two sentences. It was a skirmish. So you've seen what happened. He took it. Right. James W. Cook, commander of the Albemarle, set out, uh, sailed out of Plymouth in early May of 1864 along with the captured steamer CSS bombshell oh, no plus the transport CSS cotton plant. Steaming south towards New Bern, Cook ran into a Union fleet at the mouth of the Albemarle Sound, commanded by Captain Melancton Smith. The fleet consisted of the Double Ender gunboats, USS Mattabasset, the S- Sassicus, the Wyalusing, um, and the USS Miami. And then we also had the converted ferry boat, USS Commodore, Commodore Hall, <laughs> <laughs> the USS Commodore Hall, USS Ceres, USS Whitehead, and you got to pop that motherfucker, right. and the USS Isaac and Seymour. Seymour! <laughs> Skinner, is it Seymour or Skinner? Skinner. Is it Seymour? It's a Seymour Skinner, though. Yeah, because it's a Seymour. Feed me, Seymour. Right. Uh, when the old rebel ships were spotted, the Matabasset, the Sesuchus, the Whitehead, and the Wyalusing immediately formed a line of battle, supported by the Miami, the Commodore Hull, and Ceres. Albemarle opened first. Open fire at first, wounding six men working on the Matabasset's two 100 pound parrot rifles. Hmm. Matabasset, Whitehead, and Wide Loosing opened fire almost simultaneously. The Albemarle then attempted to ram Matabasset, but the side wheeler managed to round the ironclad's armored bow. Right. Awesome. She was closely followed by Sassicus, which had been a, which had then fired a broadside of a solid nine inch and 100 pound shot. All of which bounce off Elmar's case. I said, armor. "Come on, are you serious? Like, like, what was that? Whatever." However, bombshell, which is CSS, 
being a softer target, was hauled by each heavy shot from Sassicus's broadside mm. and surrendered. I bet it did. Cotton Plant withdrew back up the Roanoke, and Albemarle continued the fight alone. Said, I don't care. Get the hell out of you, pussies. Right. Smith, despite an advantage numbers, could do little damage to the single Confederate ship. Right. Shots glanced off Albemarle's sides. Lieutenant Commander Francis Asbury Rowe of the Sassicus, seeing Albemarle at a range of about 400 yards, decided to ram it. Oh. He said, all right, maybe this will, uh, <laughs> we got a battering ram on the end of this, bitch. It's wow. like probably made of bronze or something, right? Mm, the Union ship struck the Confederate ironclad full and square. Yeah, but bronze versus iron, that's, uh, mm. the bronze is just going to go, Oop. Yeah. Broadside on, shattering the timbers of her own bow, twisting off her own bronze ram in the yeah. process, on, and bronze. jamming both ships together. Jeez. With Sassicus's hole almost touching the end of the ram's brook rifle. Oh, jeez. Armor Albemarle's gun crew quickly fired two point blank rifle shells, one of them puncturing Sassicus's boilers. Uh, though live steam was roaring through the ship. She was able to break away and drift out of range. She said, bye. Right. <laughs> uh, he just burns half my crew. But Sessicus by now was too damaged to function and drifted downriver, wounded. <laughs> <laughs> Miami first tried to use her spar torpedo and then to tangle the Confederate ram screw propellers and rudder with a cyan net. But. Neither ploy succeeded. Oh, man. Meanwhile, the Matabessa and the Wyalusine continued to engage the ram for three hours until the action was halted by darkness. More than right. More than 500 shells were fired at Albemarle during the battle with visible battle damage to her smokestack and other areas on the ironclad. She steamed back up the Roanoke. Commodore Hall and Ceres moved to the river's mouth. Yeah, where the hell are these guys at? Right. Uh, they moved to the river's mouth to try and keep the Albemarle from re-entering the sound. They said, you ain't going nowhere yet. Ooh-wee. Well, the battle itself was a standoff, but the events that followed had more decisive results. The Albemarle had held its own against greater numbers, but the damages caused, a, caused during the battle had forced the ship into port for the next several months. Damn. Gotta fix that shit. Preventing it from being used in General Hoke's plan to saw a new burn. Damn. Damn. He needed that Poor shit. Poor guy. Hoke went ahead, though, with his campaign, even without the ship. He achieved nothing. <laughs> before You'll being... get nothing. Good day. <laughs> right. He achieved nothing before being recalled to Virginia to help defend Petersburg and Richmond. Ooh. The events in October had a greater impact on the situation when William B. Cushing, Hey. Had a naval raid and detonated a torpedo beneath the Elbemar hole. Hey, bye bye. The removal of Hoke's force and the destruction of Elbemar's allowed both Plymouth and Washington, North Carolina, to fall back into Union hands. All right, well, take a look at all those battles coming up clearly, but that was a big, I mean, they fought for five hours, wasted ammo on this big ass ironclad. I guess probably stopped Hoke from taking, uh, New burn again, though, so good for him. Right. Uh, yeah, it was a big nothing burger on that battle. Pretty much both of these battles, big nothing burgers. Yeah, what are you going to do? You got to do them all. <laughs> Pokemon. <laughs> the Pokemon of, uh, damn, that was only 26 That's minutes. Fine. Right, not even. I mean, what are you going to do? I thought it was going to be longer, but. What are you going to do? That's all right, because next week. Mm-hmm. We got a good one. Next week we'll make up for that because we'll it's, okay, well, yeah. it's the big one of the 1864, which is the Battle of the Wilderness. Took we're, place over uh, May 5th through the 7th. We're going into the wilderness in Virginia. Oh, we're going back to Virginia, back Virginia. Uh, Virginia. yeah, we got a yeah, we got a lot back there. To that might be an hour long at least. Uh, we got the big boys here. We got Grant, Meade, Hancock, Warren, Sedgwick, Sheridan, Burnside over on the Union side. Damn. Lee, Longstreet, Ewell, A.P. Hill, and old Jebby. Oh. Old Jebby's done roaming the countryside looking for Lee. I think he found him now. We got 118,000 versus 66,000 in favor of the Union. Also, the casualties and losses are also in favor of the Union. Uh, well, not the good kind of favor. Uh, Robert E. Lee has been trying to uh, fix his wrongs. This is also the first battle in Gettysburg the- and uh, oh, Vicksburg. Ever- right. Mm. Well, Ever the whole eighteen oh, whole year of eighteen sixty three, yeah. pretty much. So it. Well, if you didn't have Jeb Stewart running around trying to find him, <laughs> what the hell? Uh, this is the first. And be- if they didn't kill the, their best general that they had, oh, well, idiots. That was, yeah, what are you gonna do? Well, they didn't kill him. He was, he was an idiot and decided to go out during night, which he was told repeatedly, "Don't do." Don't do. 
I'm a stone what? Idiot. And then got killed by his own men. Stupid. Yeah. Uh, this is the first battle of the Overland Campaign, which includes the Wilderness, Todd's Tavern, <laughs> right. Right. Spotsylvania Courthouse, Yellow Tavern, Meadow Bridge. Nor- they they all like, hey, man, let's we'll go to the damn tavern and fight there. <laughs> uh, North Anna, Wilson's Wharf, Hall Shop, Totopotomy Creek, Old Church, Cold Harbor, Trevilian Station, and St. Mary's Church. And how long was this campaign? I mean, uh, May and June of 1864. There's really? a lot of battles there. And all, we had, whoa, in this whole campaign. Dude, the Union was getting their ass handled so much that they uh, gave power from me to Grant. They're like, oh, shit. And then the, the rebels were like, Robert E. Lee, take care of this shit. No, Grant already took power in March. Grant became the head of the overall army in March. What the fuck was Meade there for? Meade is the Army of the Potomac. Oh, he took over yeah. uh, for uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Grant was general in chief of all Union armies. Right, he directed he the Potomac. actions of he directed the actions of the Potomac commanded by Meade. Oh. Uh, so basically he was the big guy there. Right. But um right, right, right. Through this whole campaign of the Overland campaign, we had 7,600 killed for the Union compared to about 4,300 killed for the Confederates. That's crazy, dude. Yeah. This is a deadly battle. 54,000. 55,000 casualties for the Union. 38,000 wounded, of which I don't know what. Probably half of them died. Half of them died, and half of them, the other half, probably never fought again. Amputated. Mm hmm. Or some other fucking shit that they never lived a good life. All right. Crazy, then, dude. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That's the Battle of the Wilderness starting the Overland campaign. So we got a lot of... Dude, he looks like a drunk. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. looked like he was drunk in that picture. <laughs> he probably was. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot more Virginia. Dude, we got... Sweet Virginia. Like seven Virginia battles in a row. Yeah, Coming up. Of- and then a lot of Virginia. Virginia and Georgia pretty much dominates the summer. Yeah. Yeah, we got all that stuff coming up. Good stuff. Uh, March to the Sea, Battle of the Wilderness, Overland Campaign. So uh, heavy boys are fighting coming up instead of this bullshit-ass Arkansas-Missouri bullshit. Literally did nothing to affect the war. Fucking feather featherweights. Right. Welterweights. Whatever, dude. <laughs> Once again, go check out our YouTube at Bang Dang Network. Shorts, clips. We're about to get Foreman and Ali, baby. Exclusives. We'll see you next week on the Battle of the American Civil War. We are the Mother of Michigan. Bang Dang.